from the Virginia Gazette in 1772. Run away from the subscriber in Dinwiddie on Sunday the 16th of February, a likely Virginia-born mulatto fellow named Dick, about 30 years of age, a thick, well-made fellow, five feet seven or eight inches high with gray eyes, short hair curled close to his head, a very large, a very large black beard, and a, a sore on his right leg. He's a shoemaker by trade and very handy about any other business. He may probably attempt to pass for a freeman, as he can read and write. He wore or carried with him a light-colored duffel greatcoat, a Negro cotton double-breasted short coat, dyed purple breeches of the same, a red frieze waistcoat lapelled, which is rather too large for him, a white linen shirt marked I.W., a beaver coating short coat of the pompadour color, but much altered, with slash pockets double-breasted and lined with shalloon. He ran away about three or four years ago and then harbored about Mr. Harwood's at Wyanoke. He has a brother belonging to Mr. David Scott of Prince George, who has been run away for a year or two and was several times brought from among the Indians on Pamunkey River. They probably will make, may make that way together or to Urbana as they are both acquainted with Mr. Mills, Mills Negroes. I hereby forewarn all masters of vessels from employing the said slave or carrying him, carrying him out of the colony. I will give the above reward besides what the law allows to any person that will secure him so that I may get him again. He is outlawed. Very nice. Now, I want you to read that again. You remember I told you about the degrees? This is a new arrival, outlandish, Creole. <coughs> this is not a creolized Negro. This is somebody who just stepped off the boat. His options, his understanding, his ability to use the system for his own good, minimal. We're moving on up now from the beginning. Run away from the subscriber. Stop. Who's that? Who's that? Who's the subscriber? Oh, I like that. What did he say? The person who's purchasing the ad. The person who put the ad in the paper. Mm. Move on. In Dinwiddie, on Sunday the 16th of February. Stop, stop, stop. What do we know about the day of the week? What's important about that? So unless they were a cook in the kitchen, they were working seven days a week, or unless it was someone who was required to work, we know that they worked six days a week. We know that generally they had one day off, and that one day was Sunday. When did Broham decide to go? Because they're not looking at him. They're not thinking about him. It's a day of rest. He might go off to visit someone else on another plantation or on another farm. But the ability for him to move is much more possible and probable on a Sunday than any other day during the week, unless it's rain season. And then they're out in the fields transplanting tobacco. But that's another story. Go ahead, young lady. A likely Virginia-born mulatto fellow. Stop. What's mulatto? Mixed. Black parent, white parent, generally. M-U-S-T-E-E, -E, musty, is what was designated black parent, Indian parent. In the Caribbean, you have quadroon, you have octoroon. Not here, not in the colonial Chesapeake, not in low country South Carolina that I'm aware of. Move on. Named Dick about 30 years of age, mm -hmm. a thick, well-made fellow, mm -hmm. five feet seven or eight inches mm -hmm. high, 
with gray eyes, mm -hmm. short hair curled close to his head. Stop, stop, stop. Short hair curled close to his head. <laughs> this is not, this is not it. <laughs> it was an 18th century jerry curl. <laughs> nice. Not a nicer brand of hair than mine or his. As my daddy used to say, close to Jesus grass. <laughs> <laughs> Move on. A very large black beard. Stop. <laughs> um, I, when I started working at Colonial Williamsburg, I had a beard. And uh, the curators and the historians, especially the historians, said to me, Rex, you're going to have to shave the beard. I said, why? They said, because there's no evidence of blacks with beards in the 18th century. See, 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 one of the things I tried to teach um, or try to suggest to those that I trained at Colonial Williamsburg and anybody else who would listen to my, my, my idiocy was if you ask a historian to take you to the document he or she read and you read the same things the historian reads, and you come up with a different opinion. If you've read everything they've read, is not your opinion just as valid? And so I found that document, not that historian. And was I happy I found it? <laughs> Trying to steal my humanity? No. So very, very important. Go ahead. And a sore on his right leg. Yes. He's a shoemaker, but isn't it trade. interesting that no that that when they were putting these ads in the paper, they had no idea we'd be sitting here talking about it now. All they were trying to do was get their property back, and what they were trying to do was describe <coughs> as specifically as possible their property, so that they could get it back. Average um, uh, craftsman in Williamsburg. Williamsburg was an urban place, a very hostile place. It was the capital, colonial capital, uh, before it moved. Uh, that place. Uh, a, a craftsman made 10 to 15 shillings a week. It took 20 shillings to make one pound. Average price of a slave, 20 pounds. A year's wage to about one. A year's wage. Valuable piece of property. Move on. And very handy about any other business. He may probably attempt to pass for a freeman, as he can read and write. <coughs> he wore or stop, 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 stop. <laughs> stop, stop. <coughs> he may attempt to pass as a freeman because he can read and write. I called a historian and asked him. What was the percentage of white people who were literate in the 18th century? He said 80%. I said, now define literacy. He said, good question. <laughs> it's one of those times in my career that I wonder what misconceptions I would have left with if I had not asked that question. He said they could write their name and they could read a passage from the Bible. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Rex Ellis. I'm literate. So for all intents and purposes, let's not get too excited about the fact that he was literate. What we're saying is he was just as literate as anybody who was around him. You're talking about 10% of the population who had the kind of literacy that we uh, ascribe Thomas Jefferson and uh, uh, Hamilton and Mason and all the rest of them to. Everybody else didn't have that as one of the major things they wanted to do in life. 